and try to stay uh, loyal to his buddies in Mr. Bungo, but obviously trying to, you know, uh, check out this opportunity to be in Faith the Moor. So I think that's what was happening. Was there a reason why you didn't do that first Mr. Bungle record? Uh, yeah, I, I turned it down. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat, yeah, Pat asked me to do it, and I probably should have done it, but it's just not my kind of music, and I have to work on things that, that uh, kind of connect with me. Um, and I just, I just found Mr. Bungle stuff just really obnoxious, and I didn't particularly like it. Uh, but in retrospect, I should have done it, because I don't think Pat ever really forgave me for turning it down, because he, he was kind of mad at me uh, after that. So just one of my kind of music. I mean, I appreciate how good they were, how, how physically adept and accomplished they were, but I just was not into that kind of music. And to me, I mean, you can map out Mr. Bungle very easily. It's like, uh, play something for four bars, make a left turn. Play something, play another thing for four bars, make a left turn. It was just this thing that kept happening, and um, it just <laughs> yeah. wasn't my kind of piece. Yeah. It was, like, it, was like, it was like, you know, it was like, you know, sophomoric, you know, you know, uh, video game playing, dirty guys kind of music, and just, again, really accomplished musicians, really a tremendous amount of talent there, but just not my, my style of music. And I probably, I should have done it. It probably would have been a really cool record to make, and I probably would have got a lot of cool uh, potential other bands to work with after that. But anyway, I had to follow my gut. I can still remember listening to it for the first time and thinking, man, that's going to change music forever. But it could have been the um, the hit of LSD. Do you think Mr. Bungle was going to change music forever or the real thing? I did. Well, the real thing uh, came in and I thought did change it. I can still remember going back and being completely burned out with the 80s sound or just all the 80s music. And kind of even if I go before that, I was into like soul music and Rick James when I was younger and, and really into that stuff. And I just remember it hit a it, uh, it hit a wall at some point where I felt like it it wasn't growing. Same thing I felt right. with the 80s, and I can just remember finding that um, the real thing and, yeah. and thinking, I thought it did save music, but Mr. Bungle yeah. was one of those that I just thought, holy shit, I just thought that record was uh, going to kind of change sort of the structure of music. Like you said, go four bars and then next and, and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mr. Bungle was just too limited in scope, I think, to really... Uh, be groundbreaking or make the impact that, that the real thing. The real thing actually crossed over. I mean, it was like they're an indie band. They crossed over to pop radio, which was unheard of uh, for uh, for rap metal, which had been on the radio until Faith the Forum. So that was truly groundbreaking and genre defining. And I had uh, got Corn and and all these other bands were like you know getting a hold of me after that record. I mean, you know, Hoopa Stank and uh, uh, System of a Down. All these people when they heard the real thing, that was like a groundbreaking record. It was Uncle. Yeah, I mean, it's just Bungle to me is just very, uh, the smaller audience. Again, still exceptional, but, you know, it's kind of like Frank Zappa. I mean, Frank Zappa was really cool, but he never really broke through the mainstream. There's a lot of cool people that, that, you know, or Captain B part or people like that where they're, they inspire a lot of bands, but they never make it to the top. That ride that they took on the real thing seems like, uh, almost a mistake with just their style of music, uh, just almost like, uh, a freak occurrence, rather, not a mistake, yeah. but just a freak occurrence yeah, yeah. that they um, yeah. hit it that big. I think you're, I think you're absolutely correct. We just went from Smash to Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers, I, mean, I can't count how many times they're like, man, we love this record, but, you know, radio's just not going to play it. Sorry, you know. And just, I heard that we heard that so many times. And because the, the band toured across the United States like three or four times in a the van, they went to England a couple times, they generated the momentum to where it finally busted on through. And uh, even MTV had that video for Epic, and they sat on it for six months before they did anything with it, so it's really, it was kind of a freak occurrence, and uh, it's really by virtue of the band pushing so incredibly hard while they're doing their touring, and uh, making, I think, exceptional records, that's, that's what it was about. As far as Epic goes, do you have any kind of notion that you thought that song was going to blow up like that? Uh, I don't think I did. I know the band, it was really interesting, because while we were making that record, all the guys in the band thought we were making a pop record. And I was like, ah, I don't know what kind of pop music you guys listen to, but I don't think this is a pop record, you know? And it was just so, you know, it was metal and had rap, and, and so it didn't feel like a pop record to me. But they certainly thought it was, and they were correct. <laughs> yeah, I came from more of a pop background. I, I worked on some of those more melodic and pretty and stuff like that. I mean, along with the big, uh, ugly stuff, too. Uh, but my idea of what pop was was not what they were able to accomplish. They, they were totally correct. 